Hello, I'm Mariko Takagi, and I'm happy to talk at the A Taipei this year. My topic is uh, Kanjigafi and Hanjigafi, and this is a theme for a research that I am uh, doing for quite a while now. So today my talk is divided into four parts. Like first I will talk about like how, how I started this project at all and what was the motivation. Then I will carry on with uh, projects I have done in the past and then going on to the new project which I have started recently. So the point of departure is very closely related to myself. Whenever I talked about Japanese writing system, I came across um, preoccupations and stereotypes, and I will introduce you one of them. So the most famous one, I would say, is like comparing kanjis or the original um, yeah, characters which came from China with pictographic ideas. So saying that uh, Chinese characters are still very closely related to the images. And this is like, for example, one example, an illustrator explains how characters works. And Stephen Kuhn, a German linguist and Japanologist, he criticizes like this habit of Japanese, but also Western scholars making this connection between image and character. And uh, Marshall Ungar, another researcher from Hawaii, he even wrote a book about the sixth myth about Chinese characters. And like the, the first one is what I just described with the uh, relatedness to images, but there are also other uh, myths which are very strongly um, inhabited like by people thinking about uh, Chinese characters or kanjis. But those are um, a little bit dangerous because if you carry on with this myth, you do not, De um, develop a new idea about the ability of the characters or what the characters can carry as an information. Christa Dörscheid um, in Einführung in die Schriftlinguistik says that it is uh, wrong to uh, name modern Chinese script as pictographic or ideographic. And when I wrote her text, I was very happy because I thought like I found a key like to a problem that I always saw. So um, she says that mainly there are two different systems of writing. Like one is the logographic writing system. The other one is the phonographic writing system, which contains again, syllabic writing and alphabetic, the alphabetic system. And if you divide the writing system into, or writing systems into these two major groups, uh, you can see that uh, somehow like the Japanese uh, writing system is um, using all, all of the two, or if you want to say three systems. So for example, for the logographic writing system, you have the kanjis. And on the other hand, phonographic syllabic writing, uh, you find in hiragana and katakana and Latin letters are the phoneme or alphabetic system. So especially Latin letters become more and more yeah, trendy in Japan as well. So the first time that I tried to put my thoughts into writing was uh, when I did my PhD at the University of Braunschweig 2008 uh, till 2012. And uh, in this like research, I started first like talking about identity, stereotypes and otherness and trying to relate it to the Japanese writing system. I also put in um, the Japanism and Japanimation, which is more related to art, but still like saying how um, Japan is visualized or coded in a way. And the more fascinating areas to me, or yeah, which is like somehow still my topic today is Japanese writing system and also the Japanese uh, typography, like how the writing system is visualized in typographic matters. And um, this still like uh, continued to the next um, books I wrote. So for example, the first one um, picking up like one idea from the PhD was in my Hanjigafi book, which I will introduce to you later. But in this book, I only focused on Chinese characters and their elements. So somehow 
like taking up tiny bit and expanding it. So um, Hanjigophy and Kanjigophy were the first two books that I released on the research on writing system and typography. And I will show you like some insights about the projects from yeah, now on. So Hanjigophy was uh, a project that I started after coming to Hong Kong, which was uh, in 2010. I was still working on my PhD, and, but I wanted to do something related more to my surrounding at that point. Uh, so about Hong Kong and their writing system and the written culture. Um, and normally like you will start first doing the writing and then doing an exhibition, but for Hanjigophy, I did the opposite. I first started like to think about an exhibition because I was quite busy by teaching and um, yeah, doing my other projects. And so I thought like if I have the pressure of doing an exhibition, maybe uh, it will be also easier to do the book. And so this was my somehow strange method. And here you see a wall with elements, like I uh, compared uh, elements from Latin letters to elements from Chinese characters, but as the Chinese characters um, or the character set is such a vast, yeah, or big um, issue and they have so many characters. So the even the elements have very, very different uh, detailed shapes. So if you say hook, a hook is not one shape, but you have multiple shapes. So I tried to express that. And at the same time, what was very important to me because um, already my PhD, I talked about stereotypes. So I didn't want to say like the one system, the Latin letter system is better or the uh, kanji, hanji or Chinese character system is better. But I wanted to say there are equivalent partners. So they have different characteristics. Um, of course, uh, in some um, areas, this is better or the other is better but still like they are equi equivalent writing systems. And so I uh, wanted to visually also transport that. And I wanted to visually transport also the beauty of details in the Chinese character set. When I talk to, for example, um, yeah, Chinese or Japanese people, most of the case they say like the Latin letter typography is so much cleaner because they do not have too many components. But um, yeah, I tried to show like also in this kind of vast variety is a certain um, beauty and this is maybe not uh, yeah, less good or um, better than the Latin letter system. And uh, yeah, the slide before you have seen a classification um, chart and here you see posters on the history of uh, the writing systems. The six um, from left are the Chinese character history set, and then you have two on the Latin letter set. And after doing two exhibitions on um, yeah, Han Jigofi, I have finished my book. And in the book, I focus somehow on the visual attributes or on the visual elements of the Chinese characters. And for me, it was important like to write it in English so that it is uh, accessible to a, a bigger yeah, um, readership. But at the same time, I wanted to also um, overcome stereotypes and uh, addressing then maybe English readers. And also like another very important point for me in this project was that I do not only write everything in English, but um, especially like when I name the elements of characters, I do it in four languages. Like those are the languages that I had access to. So in, um, in English, in German, in Chinese and in Japanese. And um, the visuals are very important in this book to me because uh, I do not, um, how to say, I do not suggest with it, you have to learn Chinese before being able to read it, but I try to explain everything like using the visuals so that I guide you um, by words and by visuals towards an understanding of the um, Chinese characters or of the design of Chinese characters. 
So, um, yeah, and then there were always these kind of uh, structural pages within the book uh, between the different uh, chapters announcing the next topic. And this is also like what I said before about um, treating them equally and treating them as equal partners. And uh, yeah, so this is um, the Han Geography book, which is also not too long regarding the text. So I'm giving here quite a lot of uh, information also about the sources and so on. Um, and you can almost use it like as a small like helping tool. Kanjigofi was closer to my PhD in a way. So I picked up topics that I already had in my PhD, like uh, the Japanese writing system, uh, which includes the history of Japanese writing as the Chinese characters came from um, China, of course, and the Japanese language needed to adapt to the system and also the writing system needed to adapt to uh, the Japanese language. And um, in the second part of the book, I'm talking about how the Japanese writing system is then applied to typography. So it is much more text heavy, I would say, this book, and also a little bit more academic. -y. But important again was to make things uh, visible. And because I again thought my readership, which is then this book is written in German, um, which maybe the readers they are interested in typography or Japanese culture, but um, it is not a must to be able to read the Japanese. So what I'm doing in this book is rather like each image, each poster, each graphic that I'm picking up um, as an example, I'm also explaining in detail somehow like in uh, graphical ways. And of course there are some overlaps with Han geography, but uh, in a way uh, in this book, I'm going deeper like it is uh, two years after the publication of Hanjigofi. And during that time, of course, I had some findings. And here you see like one uh, graphic where I explained the component uh, of a poster. So I took the elements which are on the poster and explained it once by the uh, yeah, typographic character and then via text, like what it means and how it is arranged. And I'm doing it also for uh, this typographic uh, design by Dainipon Taipo Kumiai. So somehow, even if you're not able to read um, kanji or katakana, you can still understand the meaning. So for the next uh, book or for the next stage, there's a big um, inspiration that is already with me for quite a long time. And this is also like somehow giving me the motivation like to go on and search for the next stages. And this is um, the book by Marianne Wolf, Proust and the Squid. So I first read it uh, when I prepared myself for going to Reading for the master. And at that time, I was so thrilled to read this book. So um, it is really like enjoyable to read this book, but at the same time, there are so many interesting, inspiring uh, texts. So for example, the book starts with, uh, we were never born to read. And I think like uh, if you write a book about reading and the brain, how it, how it works together, um, you will never expect like um, an entrance sentence like this. But I think um, Marianne Wolf's book is very inspiring because it is packed with knowledge and it is um, very well researched. But at the same time, from the language that she is using, it is uh, very beautiful. And um, so therefore I'm also reading this book right now with my students in Japan. So for my book that I hopefully will release in 2022, the difference like to the previous books will be that I will talk about reading. So Hanjigofi was more on the character unit. Kanjigofi was more maybe on short sentence and the next one will be about reading. If you talk about readability or reading, then immediately Susanna Lichko's sentence, you read best what you read most, comes into our mind, especially like if you're doing typography. And um, 
this one is of course like today so famous like it is from 1990 but uh, starting my research i found uh, different like very similar sentences like from different people and i will introduce you at least like some of them um, in this talk right now so uh Susanna Lichko's, um sentence you read best what you read read most is of course not like a um, standalone sentence but she was talking in an interview with Rudy Wonderland about um, her typeface design and she's also saying maybe her typeface design will be become also something that people are habituated later on but the sentence is, uh, itself is very close to what Ogilvy said uh, 1985, the eye is a creature of habit. And although the wording is different, um, the meaning is the same. And Stanley Morrison said something very similar as well. Almost everyone reads most easily, meta, uh, easily meta set up in the style to which he has become habituated. And this is from 1959. It is an introduction to Sir uh, Cyril Bird's um, book, a, a Psychological Study of Typography. And um, in this book, um, Cyril Bird is trying to, or he is like more from a psychological point of view, studying uh, readability. And Stanley Morrison put this sentence into his introduction. And of course, in Japanese uh, research, you can find similar ideas or similar sentences. So for example, Naomichi Iwai also um, researched about typography, Japanese as well as Latin letter, and comparing it in a way and saying uh, for the Japanese typesetting, vertical typesetting is uh, much more suitable, like looking at the uh, kana shapes, but also if people are asked to read aloud or doing handwriting, um, the vertical lines are quicker or, yeah, testing person did this better. But in the same book, he's also saying about researchers that um, regarding the anatomy of our eye or of our eyes, especially the muscles, it is less effort to read horizontal lines. So although it is easier to read horizontally, like just looking from the physical point of view, because Japanese people at that time, 1949, were so much uh, used to read vertical lines that they feel easier with that. And this, I think, is quite interesting because um, I would think the anatomy is stronger than um, habit, but it is the opposite. So for my next book, uh, like I, I would like to... Um, yeah, go into like four different areas of, um, yeah, four different areas or four different chapters. Like in the first chapter, I'm thinking to um, take up uh, the story of reading. And this is more my historical or cultural historical approach um, and also quite a personal approach in this book to make this book also one that you enjoy reading. And um, yeah, that therefore it is the the way I want to do this. Um, the second chapter at that point, I will talk about uh, how we learn to read in Japanese, German, English, and Chinese. Uh, so looking into more like linguistics and cognitive science areas and comparing again then the, the languages. The third chapter, um, I'm thinking to write about reading legibility and of course then readability in the different writing system. Here, typography like is quite important to me, and finding again like differences and parallels between the different writing systems. So, the last one is like I just talked about um, our habits, and uh, yeah, somehow that reading is uh, very closely related to habits, and therefore I wanted to see how the typography and layout feeds into those habits or the habits are connected to the different styles. So yeah, this is just like where I'm just at the starting point of my journey. And uh, I hope next time at ATYPI, I can um, just show you much more on this research. 
thank you for joining me and I hope uh, yeah, to see you someday in person. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you please switch on your camera? Yes. Uh, Mariko, congratulations, first of all. That was Thank a beautiful you. presentation. Thanks a lot. And it's very beautiful to, you know, learn how you started and what was your motivation and how you have been, you know, um, working as a breeze. And it's amazing. I Thanks really like much. the part. <laughs> I really like the part that you said um, the book has been published, but the research is still going on. So it's something that never finishes, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm afraid that's the case. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> yeah, whenever I finish a book, like I find new, um, yeah, new sources or new ideas, and uh, it's somehow a never ending story. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very ending story. Hats off to your work. And um, I was like wondering, because um, let me check in the chat box if there is any question. I guess there is no any question. Where can we buy the book? You have already given the link. Um, I guess there is no any other question, right? So I have some questions because you had said in the first part, there were four different languages in which you have tried to incorporate it. What actually, you know, inspired you to do that in four different languages? Yes, yeah, the part of four different languages was quite, how to say, limited because um, in the Hanjigraphy book, I only used like somehow the, the keywords. Um, Okay. And I used only like uh, the keywords to translate it into four languages. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, in fact, like for the next book, for the third book, I'm thinking at least um, maybe doing the captions in three to four languages. Um, and I think like this is also for the idea of making a book or the book design. It could be interesting and also a new like stretch because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You see like books around in three languages or two languages, but uh, four is quite difficult to handle. So also from the perspective yeah. of layout, it could be interesting. Yeah, because even for two languages, it's very hard, mm -hmm. but you're doing that for four languages. I can imagine how hard it was. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, Sol, and Sol has a question. Yes. So the question is, why is it wrong to think that kanjis are logographic? Um, yes, yeah, especially like um, also in this case, uh, case, like how to say, uh, in this eight pi, I heard for several times the comparison between um, yeah, kanjis are images or pictures. The problem is uh, that you cannot really um, yeah, say or you cannot really transcribe all the ideas or all the feelings or all the information that you have in language into writing if you consider uh, kanjis as pictographic or kanjis as uh, images. Um, it is somehow yeah, reducing the potential of writing very much. I think on the first day, there was a very interesting um, movie, like uh, a very interesting movie was shown about the history of writing. And in this one, they were uh, introducing also the rebus system. And the rebus system is something that uh, are always invented when you have um, an image-based writing system, but you cannot, um, transcribe the phonetic ideas so mm -hmm. because in our language or when we talk we have a lot of words or a lot of components in our language that do not carry meaning so either it is something uh, maybe more from the grammar aspect and so those words need to be transcribed mm -hmm. as well and if you only use yeah, images or characters that carry meanings um, you end up somehow in a kind of code or in a kind of yeah, maze of um, elements. And so therefore you need also uh, elements in writing that do not carry meaning, that carry more like the phonetic aspect or also um, that can transcribe more abstract ideas. So if you work with a pictographic system, you can only capture things that is already around us, like what is surrounding us or what is really mm -hmm. physically existing, but you cannot transcribe um, abstract ideas. Like this is the, the difficult point. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I guess Sol has already received the answer. 
Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me check if there is any other question. So if you have any other question, we still have a few minutes to go. Maybe you can just write it down in the chat section or in question answer section. Then um, Mariko can answer your question if there is any. And uh, Mariko, like, um, I was curious to know about what kind of feedback you have been receiving from the book. Uh, from the first or from, yeah, from any of the two books, you mean? Yeah, uh, okay. any of the two books. Yeah. Or maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, when I visited last time the Eight Pie in Tokyo, um, yeah, yeah, last year it was in Tokyo, so I visited it, but I couldn't give a talk because, yeah, somehow the research was not there at that point. And, uh, yeah, some people approach me and saying that they're really using it whenever they um, yeah, need to have uh, the vocabularies or like the uh, descriptions of elements of characters, like um, some, yeah, some people in Japan, but also in China are using it as a reference book to look, mm -hmm. terms, uh, to look up terms and so on. Okay, yeah. Mm. So um, so far, you find it's being very useful, right? Uh, difficult to say it by myself. So <laughs> yeah, I can't really <laughs> judge it by myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the next question, how did your MA in type design inform or affect your research interface? Yes, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, like somehow, um, especially like for hangigraphy at that time, it was ready. Uh, so when I started um, the MA at, at Reading, I already gave my uh, manuscript to the publisher. And so it was already in the production line when I started in Reading. And for my um, second book, like Hangigraphy, it fed mm -hmm. into it because somehow, um, yeah, through the experience, at Reading, I, I think like I could explain better um, in wordings, like what I see in typography. So this mm -hmm. helped quite a lot. And uh, yeah, also like I think, especially MA, the MA at Reading rather fed into my teaching than into the book I talked about. So I think it was more um, about teaching methods and ways to teach typography. Like uh, in this way, it was extremely, yeah, to say useful is strange, but it was a big inspiration to me. Yeah, like you say, uh, the AMA things, it actually didn't influence in writing your, you know, but however, it affected your education mm -hmm. or the way you teach. Yes. However, I have, you know, I was, um, but I'm sure that the research has also affected the way you think and even in your, uh, the knowledge that you acquired from MA mm. or even the knowledge that you're acquiring from PhD. So is there any differences that you had found from your academic degree and also from the practical learning that you have learned while writing the book? Uh, okay, yeah. So somehow like from the um, MA, um, I got a lot of inspirations, especially uh, like looking at materials and, and so on. And also, I think what we read at Reading, um, the, yeah, we, we got this very long list uh, of books that we have to read for the preparation. And there were a lot of titles which are still uh, yeah, very, very important to me now. Or also the different workshops. Um, we attended or we got like different workshops and those workshops are also still um, very important to me or the experience is very important to me. Um, about the PhD, because I did the opposite, uh, yeah, opposite order. Like I did first the PhD <laughs> at uh, Braunschweig. <laughs> and while I did the PhD at Braunschweig, I thought like I, I was writing already about uh, type design and I was writing about uh, typography and typefaces. Uh, and I found out uh, that I need more information to go more in depth. And uh, I thought I need to have the experience of uh, making type to understand certain things. And so that was for me the motivation to, to go for the MA. So it was somehow the opposite direction, like first doing the theory <laughs> and then going for practice. Um, and the PhD at Braunschweig was also important because um, uh, it was to me, or the 
yeah, the PhD writing, especially or the book, which I then made, was somehow um, yeah, a big container of new ideas and a big container like for things that I want to uh, research more in depth. So, um, for example, I published last year one book about uh, a Japanese Bauhaus student, a female Bauhaus student. And I first uh, got to know her story when I was researching for my PhD. So um, <laughs> this also like continued to, or this was immediately connected to another research. So I think in this case, like the PhD was kind of a container for a lot of ideas and also for a lot of uh, things that I want to continue to research. Okay, so Stoll has yet another question and that's, what was the title of this book and who was she? Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, the book is called uh, Yamawaki Michiko or Michiko Yamawaki. And uh, it is a Japanese Bauhaus story. So um, the subtitle is a Japanese Bauhaus story and it is bilingual. So that book uh, is written in German. So I wrote the German part and I asked somebody to uh, translate it into English. And so you can have a bilingual book. Um, and the she, <laughs> the uh, woman who went to Bauhaus uh, was Yamawaki Michiko. So a Japanese woman who married uh, an architect and the architect uh, was very much in love with um, Bauhaus. And as he married into her family, like which is quite usual in Japan uh, still until now, um, the promise was that he can attend the Bauhaus. And he or the couple attended the Bauhaus from 1930 to 1932, so for two years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess if there is any more question, so you can write down in the chat section because we still have a few more minutes to go on. If there is any questions, so cool. Thank you, Mariko. So I'll say it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. If uh, if there is anything that you'd like to add on, you can surely add it on. Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I guess we have to wrap up for from the session. And if there is any more questions, they can obviously contact to Mariko directly. I guess you have also left your email ID, right? Yes. Yes. I wrote it into yeah. the chat box. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So you can also contact Mariko through her email ID, and we'll be around. Hang hangout rooms so maybe sometime we can get in there and talk to friends that we make so thank you mariko for that beautiful presentation and thank you so much i wish um, the research will reach to some uh, some point next year okay thank you <laughs> yeah, i thank hope you. i can introduce you next year the book <laughs> yeah we're we're hoping for that <laughs> okay yeah thank you yeah, thank you, Mariko. Thank you, everyone who have attended. Thank you, Itaipai. Thank you, all the sponsors, for sponsoring this beautiful conference happening 24-7 for five days. So we uh, would like to thank our presenter and everyone, the tech team, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. See you around. <laughs>